Welcome once again to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here this time with Jamie Simonoff, uh, founder, chief inventor at Ring, uh, which you might recall from the, the transaction where Amazon bought it for a billion dollars, or you might more likely recall it from Shark Tank, uh, everybody's favorite entrepreneur and funding show. Jamie, welcome. Um, I, I want to start off the way I always do, which is ask about the toughest problem that you're solving for right now. Um, you know, Ring itself was born out of a, a problem that a lot of people didn't know that they had, but a lot of people recognize now. So what's what's the challenge today? I mean, there's always, I mean, like, yeah, there's always tough challenges. I'd say right now, I think the toughest challenge is making sure you don't overemphasize the day-to-day -day challenges that are coming up. And so we have supply chain, logistics, um, inflation. I mean, like all these macro things that, I mean, everyone's being touched by, including ourselves. And my worry is that you don't want to just follow the ball. And so I, I, like, I look at it as like a fitness thing. Like if you just focus on the one muscle that's having a problem, the rest of your body will atrophy. And so I'm as worried as I am about the problems we're having, you know, and again, these macro problems, I'm almost just as worried about making sure we keep the muscle for demand because right now it's kind of like all of a sudden, if you listen to anyone talk, it's like, as if, if you build it, you can sell it. And that's, you know, that's not the, I didn't grow up like that. Like that's a different, you know, a different world. And so I think that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out is how to keep the muscles while we're doing this. Like we are getting affected by supply chain. We are getting affected by logistics and just how you work through all of that, but not over-focus on it. Well, talk to me bigger picture about, what all ring is doing now because it's more than just that initial doorbell camera even more than the floodlight camera as well um how much has the line expanded and where is how do you define what the company is right now sure so we've always defined the company as a mission which is making neighborhoods safer um i, I think it's part of what Ring's success has been is that it was never a doorbell company it was never a floodlight company it was never an alarm company it was a we call our customers neighbors it's always been a mission to make neighborhoods safer. Um, and we invent products and services that make neighbors, uh, you know, give safer neighborhoods and better neighborhoods. And so we even have our neighbors app, which is a very large uh, social um, app in the US. Uh, and we're starting to look at how it expand that abroad. So we, we actually are pretty wide in terms of the things we do, but then narrow on the scope, which is we don't build, you know, if we saw like a cool, product that we thought would be good. We don't build that. Like we're not, we're not an electronics company. We're a neighborhood company. Um, that's where we focus. Some of the stuff we're doing on the edges right now, which is I think interesting is automotive. So we realized that, that cars are in the neighborhood and they're being affected by things in the neighborhood. And so, so making, you're sort of in, ensuring that cars are safe and that you know where they are and giving that same uh, feel that we give with your home with ring, giving that to cars is really important. So we're excited about that space. And then uh, we have the Ring Always Home Cam, which is a drone. Um, and that's in response to that people want to sort of see every area of their home at every angle at some point. But you don't want to have a camera in every area of your home at every angle all the time. And so a drone be being able to fly around inexpensive, you know, less than $300, like to be able to have give that access, we think is a very interesting thing. Super hard product to build. I will give you that, but uh, we are we are working on it and and doing that. How do you work within the company? You know, you your title, your chosen main title is chief inventor. When there's an idea like a drone that flies around the house, what's your role in the um, creation of that idea, the ideation, the development? Uh, what's yeah? How do you do it? Yeah, so I mean, that's where I spend, I'd say most of my time is on like boiling down the ideation to what we want to work on and then working through the problems and working through that. I mean, I am a bit of a self-taught engineer. I built the first, you know, what was called DoorBot at the time and sort of have been involved in every product since. Uh, we certainly have a lot of teams of experts that are way better at every single thing I do. So, but, but from a macro level, I'm still... You know, I'd say like, you know, I don't have that many talents, but one of them for sure is to take an idea like that and, and bring it all the way through because 
along the, the product creation cycle, one of the problems always is the, the sort of feature creep. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very hard to get a product out because you always want to add things to it. And so, you know, seeing how to get that through, what the purpose of the product is, getting it all the way through, getting it through engineering. I mean, just, you know, with the, with the drone, we're working on stuff every week, which, uh, you know, an issue of a sensor not seeing a ceiling and trying to figure out what that is. And so working through some of those little engineering problems, as well as just what the features are. But that's where I spend, I'd say, a majority of my time is on the products. I've never really been an operational. I mean, like, technically, I'm the CEO. Um, but I've never been an operational CEO. I've always had very, you know, great luck and have been fortunate to have great team members that are, you know, can run the operations and be much more day to day. And I really try to set the mission, the direction and the products. So then how does Ring now work within Amazon? Um, Amazon's made a number of you know, acquisitions, investments in what a lot of people would call smart home technologies which you fall within. I spoke to Eero um, some months ago as well. But how does that work in terms of both your innovation, the capital that you have access to, um, you know, having a, a big parent sure must help on the supply chain challenges. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, I mean, as a, you know, consumer electronics companies in general are, it's a, it's a big scale business. I mean, if you look at the other, Companies that are out there in consumer electronics, they're they're big. And so scale is, you know, scale comes into logistics, it comes into buying chips, it comes into every sort of part of that. So certainly it's been beneficial to be able to work within the device team at Amazon, which is where we are sort of parked at Amazon. Um, and, and that's been, been beneficial. They've also been great at allowing us this sort of autonomy to not just kind of try to fit us into, you know, like we haven't been just sort of thrown into Amazon as just like here, here's, you know, here's what to do, but, but certain pieces have been. And so we've kind of taken a hybrid approach. It's now been four years. So it's actually been a while. Um, and I, I think we've actually got to a good stasis where the, there's things that we do that are nimble and fast and, and we're able to do those. And then there's other things that, you know, Amazon, it, it's great. And we get a lot of operational efficiency from vertically integrating those with Amazon. And we've done that. So we've kind of had, I think we've reached like a good balance. Um, the team that came over with Ring, which I think if you look at a KPI of like, what's a good acquisition versus a bad acquisition after four years, um, when you see like almost all the team is still here. I mean, our, our attrition is probably less than it was before even the acquisition. So I think that's a great sign that people are are happy, they're succeeding. Um, and, you know, our, our products, we've grown the number of products and our reviews on our products are higher. So from those KPIs, I think we've been able to do a great job for customers and for, you know, for me, my team, which is, was an important part, obviously, of making decisions like this. Yeah, do, do something for me, if you will. A little weird, but kind of a, a comparison between Shark Tank and Amazon, right? Because both are, you're looking at what's the best way for me to grow Ring and the mission uh, at Ring. What's the way that uh, I, I can give value to this partner, but still maintain and protect what's most important uh, here? How how are the two things similar or different in the way that they worked out? Well, I mean, clearly one ended in a transaction and the other one did. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, yeah, different stages as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Shark Tank. I mean, Shark Tank. Without Shark Tank, I'd say I, I would not be here. Like, I definitely not. I don't think we'd be here today. I'd certainly be doing some. I, I, the credibility and awareness that we got from being on Shark Tank was just massive. We were a tiny little business in my garage doing this and struggling, um, and that just that really just raised us up. So Shark Tank, I really owe a ton of our success to Shark Tank, um, and you know, they're they're you know, I think they've been great at funding some of these smaller businesses. I'd say. You know, Amazon, what, you know, with the thesis that I had when we sold to Amazon, and I really did not, I did not want to sell the business at the time. Um, I wanted to keep running it and take it public or something. And the thesis was that Amazon, and they kept saying this, was going to let us achieve our mission and actually do it faster. And so I felt like if, if all I kept telling all my team members was we're here to make neighborhoods safer, then I have to make decisions to the business that are going to really be based on that, not just not just directly financial. And obviously it was a good transaction. So I'm not saying it was bad, but, um, and so now if you look again, like for me, the, the, the thing, you know, Amazon has let us keep to the mission. We keep, we've, 
delivered, I'd say, better products since then based on all the metrics you could show. And again, the team, I mean, to me, like if you look at any acquisition, it's really does the team stay? And Amazon, I think, has probably the best track record. I mean, if you look at a scoreboard, the number of acquisitions they've done where the team members are still there from the top down, it's incredible. And I, I think it comes from they respect the companies that come in, the people that come in, and they support them. And so, you know, if, if yeah, everyone, I, I, people want to work every day, I think, on something important. And so I get to do that at Amazon. And that's awesome. So I'm here. Nice. Um, well, learned a bit about uh, Ring, of course, and what you're up to most recently. Now I want to shift gears and learn more about you specifically. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, any siblings? Sure. sure. So born in New Jersey, uh, in Chester, which is, and, and grew up in Chester until I went to college. So uh, Northwestern New Jersey, kind of what was like cow country, I guess, when I started growing up and became a, a, you know, a dense suburb by the time I left. Uh, every farm, sort of every year, there'd be another farm would be developed into a subdivision. So um, now it's a pretty dense suburb. Um, you know, mom and dad, mom sort of stayed home. Dad was uh, kind of an entrepreneur, but more like a CFO. So he was like uh, for like smaller businesses out in New Jersey. So um, sort of exposed to business, but not, I, I would say he certainly wasn't like out building big startups. Um, had a brother who loved to play on the computer and I never, didn't talk too much. I mean, we're close, but just sort of different people. And I would always be in the basement tinkering. I mean, I literally, I was either on my BMX bike trying to break my arm or a leg uh, or was in the basement just building stuff. And so I spent really most of my childhood just kind of just tinkering and building. I had RC cars and kind of everything you could think about as a kid. Just, I, I always, I, de I definitely, engineering is something I'd say I just, you know, have a, have a sort of a, a natural passion towards. What's the first thing you built that wasn't from a kit? Probably, I mean, one of the, I mean, a, a I mean, tons of stuff. I'd say the first like really memorable one is I made a snow, like this snow sled that was a, uh, so I took all these RC car parts and, and I had a RC car plane, an RC plane and basically built like a fan sort of boat that was for the snow um, to go around. I ended up uh, chopping my hand. I still have the scar from it. I, I don't know if you can see it, but like this vertical, let's see, like it's like a vertical scar all the way down my hand where the thing got stuck and, and I went to grab it and it got unstuck and the propeller came around and sort of split my hand in, in two. So I had a lot, of trips, a lot of trips to the emergency room as a kid. I mean, like there was this place called the IMCC in uh, Chester and I, I, I definitely was one of their best customers. I mean, for sure. Uh, how old were you when, when you got that nasty gash? 10, maybe 11. Yeah. That's was, like... Yeah, high, like high fifth, parental fifth grade, I think fifth, fifth grade. I mean, I was, yeah. I mean, I, I think that the school probably knew I was like doing all this stuff. I mean, they, they probably should have had me checked out though. I mean, it was like, I mean, I was always something burns, cuts. I mean, luckily nothing, nothing too brutal, but, uh, but you know, you, you, you break a few eggs making an omelet. Why didn't your parents try to make you stop? You know, I ask myself that now. I, I don't know. Uh, um, I kind of now I have a I have a 13 year old son who's thankfully not as interested in, in sort of blowing himself up. Um, but I, I kind of think about that now. I'm like, what did why would they let me be in the basement? I mean, I was drilling stuff, cutting stuff, and I would just come up like always with some sort of wound and they never. I don't know. They didn't seem to really worry about it. I, I, I don't know if I'd let my son do what I did. So I think it's, you know, maybe, but it, you know, it was good. I, I, I got to discover and sort of learn, I guess. Now, were your parents handy? If you had those tools in the house, I imagine somebody must have been using, or, or were they bought just for you? You know, it's funny. They were really not handy. And I would have like, you know, like uh, I, I would go to like Channel Lumber was like the hardware store and I would have my dad take me there. And I'd like, you know, like, what I wanted for, you know, my birthday was like a circular saw. Um, and so I, it was actually mostly my stuff, which is it's just kind of funny. Yeah. Like I, my, my parents were in handy. My brother was, had no interest in anything sort of like that. He was playing something on the computer. I don't even know. It was like, you know, these are early like Tandy computers. So he was doing something there. And I was just, I was just sort of loved building stuff. So you were mostly analog, but with a digital edge, right? Because these were yeah. RC 
car. So, you know, there was, there's engineering in there and he was mostly, you know, screen focused. What were you, how are you with school? I mean, was it, was it interesting or was it not hands-on enough? Yeah, it was not hands-on enough. And then I, um, I kind of got two lucky breaks. So, so I went to, I was in sort of the public schools in Chester and they were, they were fine schools. Like they weren't bad schools, but um, I ended up doing really terrible my freshman year and another kid was going to this private school in New Jersey and his parents talked about it as a great place. And so my sophomore year, I ended up moving, which was like kind of hard for a kid to move in high school, but I was just sort of doing so badly. And so I went to this high school uh, called Marstown Beard uh, in New Jersey. And that was a huge, like, just the right, like, I think as like an inventor and someone who like thinks like that, like schools were these boxes that you'd be like locked in during the day and you'd be like closed in a thing. And all of a sudden I was on like a college campus. And it was like the, just the, the mentality of that just like opened me up. And then at the same time, my dad and like my parents were like middle class, like they weren't well, like they weren't rich, but they weren't like we weren't poor. Um, but it was like I remember like when I went there, like it was like it was impactful for him to pay for like private school. I mean, he was able to do it, but it like wasn't just like a like he didn't care. Like it was it was they cared. Um, and the Land Rover Defender 90 came out, which was like to me, like that was like the greatest thing I'd ever seen, like this car. And my dad said, Wait, do you want one? And I'm like, yeah, do I want one? Like, you know, like it's like I don't know. It'd be like telling me right now you can have like a spaceship. Like I'd do anything for it, you know? And so he said, get straight A's and you can get one. And I was like, and I think he said it as a joke. Like I actually don't, I don't think he was serious about it. Like I'm actually sure he was not now. Um, and uh, I did, I got straight A's. And so I went from being like a C, C, like maybe like B minus student to like literally straight A's. Um, and yeah, and so that, that that sort of helped with school, which actually got me then let, let me get into college or a better college than I probably would have otherwise. And so did the, he get the you the car? Like, what did he get you the car? He did, he did. And wow. but I, I don't have that exact one, but I still have a Defender ninety today. <laughs> wow! So that was big for you. What? Why did you like that car so much? You know, if you look at it, it's like a, it looks like it was built like it's like a, a rector set. You know, it's like a, it's like a very uh, utilitarian sort of car. And so I think I was drawn to it as like, I mean, I was also a kid in high school and it's like was the greatest Jeep Wrangler of all time. You know, it's like, a you know, and just I just thought it was so cool. And it was just funny. My dad, you know, I mean, he sort of joked. And then, I mean, he still said like it was like his happiest moment was buying that. So. So get into your parents' minds. I'm sure you probably had this conversation with them since. It sounds like the the school situation that you moved out of, it just wasn't the right fit for you. And so it must have been kind of dire for them to say, okay, we're going to spend this money to send him to this other school. And then at the school, I don't know if you were already sort of getting those C grades at the new school. To, to then say, hey, if you get straight A's, I'll get you this car. What was their mentality about the state of young Jamie that uh, caused them to place these bets? Yeah, I think it was like a Hail Mary. Like my brother was like, he did well in school. He was sort of chill. Um, and I was just, I mean, it's sort of ADD maybe. It's like sort of all of the above. Um, I, I think they were trying to figure out like what made me tick. And yeah, I, I went to the new school. I did better, but I wasn't... Uh, like it wasn't, I wasn't crushing it. Uh, I certainly was doing better and was much happier um, in that. And I think that I, I think what it was, you know, my, my dad sadly has passed away a, a while ago. Um, but I think, it, you know, I talked to him a little bit about it. I mean, now it's, it, it, he passed away before I had my son. So now it's like, I see, oh, wow. you know, I see the world through my son now, which is like, you know, such a, like you want to ask so many questions now. Um but I think it was that like they saw the potential and were frustrated that like the results didn't match the potential. Um, and they were just kept trying to figure out like what's going to unlock it. And it wasn't like with the car, you know, it was, it was money. I mean, like money was, you know, like was part of it, but it was really like trying to figure out like the incentive to do something for. It. And I think what I was school, I think I had trouble with was one is being, in a facility that I couldn't go outside and sort of have like, I just I think it just sort of killed my, my sort of my, um, you know, my passion. And then, you know, the goal, like what was the goal? And I think, you know, just, just, I, 
didn't have that, like what the reason was. And so I think when I got that and, you know, if I look at Ring, I mean, Ring was why I love Ring is the mission, you know, like it's, it's making neighborhoods safer, something I, I just right. am so excited about working on. I think so. I think like I needed that kind of thing in my life to wake up for. I wonder about that. Um, how much of it is, and I don't mean to at all demean people who get good grades. Clearly, I wasn't one of them because I'm framing it this way. But th there's a mindset that some people have and excel at where they really value external validation. And the grade sort of represents that. And then there's also this kind of creator mindset where what you really value is a job well done or something that that yeah. works. Right. And grades are sort of like, what can I do with that? Like, I'd rather make yeah. something. Do you, you think there's something to that? Yeah, I do. I think I think I think grades for me, I think what I liked was learning. I didn't care about the test. Um, and actually, with my son, uh, we homeschool him now. I, I, I don't care. I, you know, like, you think about it like CPR. If you're teaching someone CPR and they got a C on the CPR test, would you want to teach them the 30 percent extra to make sure they know it or would you pass them on to the next thing? And so I don't like grades. And again, like you're getting, I think, to the like, I don't like the concept of it because it's it's trying to like tell you where you stand in learning. And my thing is like, why don't you just learn? Like just teach, like just just so. So, yeah, I, I'm certainly not like a fan of that entire sort of system still to this day. Um, I'm a fan of learning though. I'm a fan of knowledge. I'm a fan of building. Like I love all of that stuff and I love what knowledge can do and unlock for people. So I think it's school is not bad. I just think that the, we it is this, like the concept of like the testing and just like, that's the, you know, cram, take a test for no reason, lose the information right after that. Like, don't even really know it. Like I, I think that was what I was like, never a fan of. And still to this day, like certainly not a fan of today. And there's also the problem where it seems to me in real life, there are things worth working for that don't come with external validation, at least not soon enough, not in a marking period format. And if you're used to that, it can be really discouraging. Yeah. And I always, you know, with our culture at Ring, we didn't. So we one of the cultural like things in our document was we don't celebrate. And people would take that as that like we're like a depressed, sad culture. It's, it wasn't that, it was that we're here for the customer. We're here for our neighbor. We're here to make neighborhoods better. And so unless we fix that problem 100%, what are we celebrating? And what that, what, what that would attract is it attracted people that I call them like marathoners, like a person who runs a marathon, like a mar I, I've run now two, mar two Boston marathons. It's the, it is oh. like kind of, the stupidest thing you can do, right? You train for like six months to a year. You beat your body to death. You like you wake up at 4 a.m. sometimes to go on these long runs that you have to do that you can't fit in any other time. So it's all this like, it's really hard. And then you finish like, I finished like 27,000th place in the Boston Marathon and I've never been prouder of myself. And so there was no like validation of that. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't win. I didn't get like the, the trophy. Like, you know, I did it for myself. And so I think like to me, yeah, I, I, I love attracting people to the team and I love having a culture where it's about like you do it for that internal validation, not the external. And I do think grades become that it's like a, a celebration always like you got an A, you got an A, you did it. It's like and that's not. Yeah, I don't think that's life. So after college, then what? So, at, so after college, after I, high I, school, I, I actually I meant yeah. after high school, then what? So tell me about, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I went to, I, I went to Babson college, which ended up, you know, just kind of got lucky that you know, I, I didn't really know what I was wanted to do. I, I was kind of like sort of a confused kid in high school still. And, you know, even though I, and I uh, went to Babson college had an entrepreneurship program, it was awesome. Like I got to sort of get exposed to like that and entrepreneurship is definitely, I'm, I'm an, more of an inventor than an entrepreneur. And I mean that, Entrepreneurs, I think, are more uh, focused on building a business. Inventors are focused on building a product. Um, inventors, I think, need business. So I think it's like they go hand in glove. But um, so I went to I went to Babson, sort of did that. I won the business plan competition at Babson, um, which was like a big thing. It was 1999. Dot com boom is going. Started doing business plans for people. Kind of was like my business out of college. Um, was building off of that. Then got into a 
telecom business and just I kind of then was just like on this treadmill of little crappy businesses for a while that were immediately medium successful, but not nothing was breaking out. And that was OK or like traditional school? I think as an inventor, what I like, I, it took me a long time to understand that I was an inventor, like that that was like my real passion was building stuff. And I think what satisfies an inventor the most is seeing at scale their inventions doing something for the world. Like, I mean, the, the thing that gives me the most satisfaction in Ring is that any neighborhood I drive around in almost anywhere in the world, we see Ring and we see the, I, you know, I say we, like my son and I have been traveling sort of all around the world, um, like for the last year. And, you know, we'll go to Lima, Peru. We'll go to, you know, Bogota, Colombia. And literally you walk in the neighborhood and there's like a Ring and then you, We'll talk to someone and they'll like say how it like oh it's so like you know i love how it does this and it sounds like that to me is like there's just that's the the greatest accolade i could ever get or the greatest sort of feeling i could ever get is like that and so when i was doing all these small things like some of them were okay i did a thing called phone tag that did voicemail to text but they just they were like small and and they just sort of i don't know they just didn't have that like full satisfaction of building something that really sort of was gonna impact the world. And, and, and again, with ring, like that's the, that's kind of what I got, you know, I got lucky. I mean, like everything, you get lucky to get anything that does that. Um, and so that's been, that's been the most satisfying thing with it. So a slight detour, you mentioned you've been traveling around the world for the past year with your son. And you mentioned that you're also homeschooling. Tell me how long have you been doing the homeschooling thing? Was that a pandemic thing? And is the travel around the world connected to either um, the hope of, of coming out of the pandemic or not wanting to uh, feel com confined by, uh, by global circumstances? What, what's the thinking? So I always wanted to, I told my wife from like, literally like when my, she was pregnant, like I wanted to travel the world or go live somewhere abroad with like my family um, you know, for at some point, like, you know, before, before like my, before they're older, like basically. Um, and so we always said that my wife would always kind of roll her eyes, which she was right. And then the pandemic hit and we realized like he, my son did actually really like some kids didn't do as well with the zoom school stuff. And so I think every kid is different. Uh, my son actually really liked the zoom school and it like worked out and we kind of were able to be social with like neighborhood kids. And so like, it kind of like the, the blend worked out. And so as we were coming out of the pandemic, he had to switch schools. His school ended in sixth grade. And we had to go to a new, like we had to pick a new school or go to a new school. And I kind of said, you know what? Let's just take seventh and eighth grade. Let's do homeschool. Let's just travel. And so we call it the SES, which is the Siminoff Experience School. Um, uh, definitely like, you know, he's learning like math and science and all the like normal stuff. But we, we traveled 120 days out of the last year. Um, it's a lot based on ring opportunities. So go, we go to, you know, there's, we went, we have a bunch of offices and, sort of Europe and in Northern Europe. So we went to Poland and Finland and Amsterdam and visited the offices. So he does, it's sort of around that, but then we go and, you know, he loves food. So we go and try different things in food. We were just in South America. We have an office in Buenos Aires. So we went to Lima, Peru and Colombia. Um, but it's, it is, it's experiencing the world. And um, it's been amazing watching him sort of take part in this. And for me, I just find that travel for me is again it's like exercise for my brain i i just find as a I, it just seeing different people talking to different people the diversity of just going anywhere and it could it, but in the u.s it's amazing how diverse the u.s is we just did we just drove route 66 from oklahoma city to st louis and just that like just every part of diversity of seeing things and hearing different things and different people and food and culture just like it does it. like my brain just like it just the neurons go. So what have you learned about hybrid work through that experience? And, and there, there's two different particular angles that I'm seeing in this. One is you're able to stay connected uh, no matter where you are. But then at the same time, a big part of the reason why you're doing this is so that you can be physically present in the places where you're going, because that's what's kind of firing the neurons for you. You're not sitting at home. So how does that play into what you view as important for uh, companies, businesses that need to continue to invent. So I think it's a, I, I think that, like, 
great way to sort of frame it, which is, I think people should be allowed to experience the world. And, and, and if you don't need to be at the office, I don't know, you shouldn't be forced to drive an hour in traffic to go sit at your laptop for eight hours and then go drive an hour in traffic home and be away from your family if you don't need to be like, so I think the day to day going to the office and doing that, I, I don't understand that if you don't need physically to be there. And there are some physical jobs, obviously, where you need to be there physically. So I, and I think it also clogs the roads for the people that do need to be there physically. So there's all sorts of stuff with that. However, physically being together to your point, there is something magical about that. Like as humans, there is something about us physically being together that matters. And so I think as a, as a mission driven product and company, what I did see through the pandemic is we all slowly lost the why. Like, why are we getting up every morning? Why are we working so hard? Why do we care so much about customers? Like, I think we still did a good job at it, but it wasn't the same. And I, I think even in my heart, I lost it a little bit. And so I've been going from office to office and back and meeting with the teams in person. And it is amazing how that kind of gets that back. And so I think there's a, I think the hybrid is we should be together a bit um, when we need to be, but but we shouldn't all be, I, I don't believe we should all be in offices every day. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but, but, I, but again, I think, but I think the fully remote, I actually don't believe that actually is a, um, I think you lose too much. There's some intangible energy that I think you lose and it becomes, you become too transactional. You know what I'm finding is really bad over video conference, you know, name your flavor, teams, you know, uh, Google Meet, whatever, power dynamics. Like if you're trying to convince somebody who is more powerful of something, uh, doing it in person, I think, uh, you know, over a cup of coffee or over lunch or whatever is a whole different deal than trying to <coughs> deal with something emotional and nuanced over a video call. Yeah, it's, it's even the delay times when you have like 10 people and what we have found is don't have a conference room with five people and have three people call in. Like that's like that dynamics also bad. So if you're going to call in to like have a video thing, make sure everyone's a, a like a head on the video. Don't have this like room versus them. Um, but I, I agree. There's something about human. Like, I mean, it, you know, it, it's great. Like it turns out we're not robots and we won't be replaced by robots because there's something about being human. Like there's some energy that's unexplainable that when we're together, like you said, having a cup of coffee, that we come up with better ideas and we brainstorm things differently. And, you know, your point of travel and seeing things like there's like, no one needs to travel. You can see a picture of any place, go on Google maps and click on the waterfall in Tanzania. Like you don't need to go there. You can see a picture of it, but yet there's something about being there that like just puts you in, you know, puts you in a different place. And so, yeah, I think there is, something to that. And I think that's what we as leaders need to figure out now, because I, I don't think going back to just like, you know, 2019 way of working is going to be right. But I would say I'd also be horrified if we go to 2020 way of working forever. Hmm. Okay. Now jumping back to post-college Jamie, who's been doing all these sort of different jobs, writing business plans for people, whatever. Um, at what point after you realize that at core, you're mainly an inventor, do you take that leap into, all right, I'm, I'm going to start inventing, even if that means um, not as much money's flowing in. Yeah. So I told my, my wife was uh, working in Hollywood and was actually starting to do pretty good. Um, and she's since had a great career and still, still works today and then works at Sony. Um, and I like kind of went home and I said like one day, like I'm, super frustrated with all this stuff. Like I'm, I'm building these little businesses and they're not, and I just want to go in the garage and work on these inventions and work on them longer and figure out like what the thing would be that actually will sort of break out. And I'm going to just do that. And it was like, and she, it, she's still, I mean, she's super supportive. Like, you, you know, you can't, certainly you can't, I don't think you can be successful without the people around you. I mean, it takes the team. And so like the team starts the family. And so my wife, you know, my, at the time my son was two and a half. So like, if you go back, we we're living in a little, the, I think the most, the, the least priced home in our neighborhood in LA, like it was the, the house we bought. Like, so we, we bought the, the, the lowest entry price we could get. Like that was what we could afford. So, I mean, we were not like crushing anything. 
And I went to the garage and some neighbors thought I was crazy. Um, and I started working on all these kind of inventions, um, a gardening thing, a conference call thing, just like all this stuff. And what's funny is it wasn't any of the inventions. It was the fact I couldn't hear the doorbell in the garage that had me build ring. Uh, why do you think, and, and I don't know if you've, if you guys have talked about this, why did your wife say, okay, great idea, Jamie. Um, th there are lots of reasons why a spouse would say, eh, what if you do that on the side still while you, or was there something that she had seen in what really engaged you? It, she believed in you clearly. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think, I, I think it just comes down to like, sometimes and, and again, it's like when the venture capitalists, like when they have these crazy breakout companies and you're like, why did you invest in this person? Like the, everything was crazy. And they're like, I just like the person, like, you know, it's like, I just believe in the person. And so I think you, you know, she took the flyer to just, you know, like believe in me. I mean, it wasn't, I, I certainly was not the ideas themselves. Like, I don't think she was like, Oh, the snap garden is the greatest idea I've ever heard. Um, I think it was just like, he's going to figure it out. And like, this is what he wants to do. And like, um, that's like the, the, you know, that's the, the thing we did. So I, yeah, I think it was just belief. So originally for DoorBot, um, and you've said this before, it was the fact that you were in the basement. I assume you were working on building a gardening thing or, or, or something and you couldn't hear the doorbell and you thought, well, that's messed up. Why can't, I, why can't I get this on my phone? That's actually in a way different from the, the neighbor's mission, isn't it? How did, how did that, um, the why behind the idea evolve? So that goes back to so that. That was what was the great thing of like leaving myself in the garage and not forcing, like I was putting all these like inventions and doing all this stuff. And so I build all of a sudden this thing and I put it on the front door and I like my wife, I'm like, here, this is how this thing works. And you know, it was a hacked up camera with a button. It was terrible. And she, she said, this makes me feel safer at home. Like it feels like we now have gates on our house. Like we lived in a little house right on the street. Um, and she said, like, it makes me feel like we have gates. And that was, I would say the first part of the aha was like, and, and to your point, like I didn't, I didn't invent it for that. It's like my invention was doing that. And I, I was, I guess the, the thing that I was smart enough was I was smart enough to identify what it was doing and sort of see how the market was reacting my wife and then realize that like, oh, actually the invention is the mission. Like if you look at like, again, why did Ring sell for over a billion dollars? it wasn't the doorbell. It was the mission that allowed it to be so impactful. That was what was valuable. And so if we had just tried to build a doorbell business, like if that was like, my goal was to build the best doorbell. I mean, who knows, but I don't even know if it would still be existing or if it would, I certainly don't think it would have been a big business. Uh, when, when it was doorbot and when you were first building this, this was a weird contraption and idea you you're starting to have like you had webcams that connected to computers i think maybe there were even some kind of around the house kind of cameras that plugged in to things there were gopro cameras there was the stuff that was in your phone but um apply cameras built into appliances that connected to huh? that served a purpose where you pushed it that wasn't that wasn't a thing well, right. also, you, know, you got to put yourself back 10 years, which is crazy. It's only ten, like, it's like one of those, like, nothing's changed. Everything's changed. I remember the first meetings with investors and they're asking me, well, you know, only 9.6% of people have a smartphone. So your market can only be like this, you know, you can only sell to a fraction of the market. But, you know, like it wasn't like the market didn't have smartphones. This was right. Like the, the, the iPhone is what, 11 years old now, 12 years old. So they didn't exist. And so the timing, and that's why I say luck. Like I wasn't smart enough to know everyone was going to have a smartphone and three years after that or whatever, that Android was going to, I mean, like, you know, like maybe I could in my gut feel some of these macro trends, but I wasn't like, I'm not like, no one's that smart. And so I just got lucky that timing wise, I got into the market when it was nascent and it wasn't a fully, like the TAM wasn't fully there. And then when it did become like that, the TAM was fully there, I was already established. And so like you, you probably could not have picked on a pin with a pin, a better time to start because it did take, you know, some iterations and cycles of failure. And we did those when the market was nascent, when you could do that. And then once the market took off, 
you didn't have that right. Like once the market's taking off, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, make those mistakes all the way through. I don't remember Shark Tank before DoorBot. I don't remember how long it, it had been going on, but at what point did you get connected with the possibility of being on the show? So it was that summer I met someone for breakfast or lunch and they said that they heard from a producer that they're looking for like bigger things. And here was an email that had been going around. And so I literally just blind emailed the producer at Shark Tank and said, Hey, would you, you know, here's my product. What do you think? And they said, wow, this looks great. And, you know, send in an application. And so, I mean, there's like 30,000 people applied. So I really didn't give it much, um, you know, weight. And then you know, it just happened that like, and it was like one of those, like every step, you know, if the past legal and this and jazz and the, and then we filmed in September of 2013. Um, and uh, they don't, when you get off, they don't tell you when you're going to air or if you're going to air. Like some people don't even get on the air because it's like their segment, just whatever. And so we filmed in September. We probably would have been bankrupt in January or February, the way we were going. And we ended up airing in November, which I had no control over, which was now we're going into the holidays. Um, and I go on you know, ABC for 30 minutes, um, or sorry, for, for 13 minutes of airtime. Like, you know, it's like a 13 minute commercial on prime time. And we had just started to get product into ship out. So it was like, I mean, again, like talk about luck. So why were you going to be bankrupt? Because we, the, the physical product is just so capital intensive. And I'd ordered all these products. I couldn't pay for them. I would never have been able to sell them fast enough. I had to do a minimum order size to get them made. So I just like looking at it now through my lens of like, you know, reality, we just probably would have just gotten stuck with too much product, not be able to pay for it. And, you know, the overhead of continuing to run the business as we're shipping and just every, all the costs would have killed us. Um, what I needed was a 13 minute free commercial at prime time to talk about my product to the entire country so that they'd buy millions of dollars of it, which I, which I got. And that's again, like, you know, that's like, it's literally like a lottery ticket. But that also creates right. A different problem, which is that you, you went from having inventory that you couldn't move to having more demand, I imagine, than you had inventory. So how do you turn that demand into capital that you can then use to get the flywheel going? Right? So, so luckily, I'd say like you both are a problem. I'd always take the over demand under supply <laughs> yeah. problem with the versus the, I, I've had both and I'd say the, the other one is worse. So, so having too much money come in and know where to put it and like to figure it like in terms of like to, to service it is it's still a, a totally is a problem. Um, you know, we just sort of made our way through it. We ran out of product, we ordered more, um, started hiring more engineers, gearing up, which is a cash flow issue. But that also now all of a sudden, like if you're looking at like the step of building the business, like this linear slope with Shark Tank, we like jumped like a whole step. Like we literally like just jumped up. Like we just had this like giant leap. And now I could go attract better venture capital money, which was kind of looking at me, but I was so dangerously small and fragile. No one wanted to put money in. Now it was like, oh, he's, you know, they're doing three plus million a year in sales. They've sold some units. They have some engineers. Like now it's like, it looks like a real thing. We're going to put 5 million in. And, that, and then that, you know, the, so the flywheel really got kicked off, I'd say with Shark Tank. Now you, you might've already started to tackle this, but I always ask about what I call the death Valley moment, the lowest point um, when it looks like you might have to give up whatever it is that you've been working on, working toward. Um, maybe that uh, kind of pre shark tank airing was your death Valley moment. Um, but often entrepreneurs have more than one. So either in life or, or in business, is there another one? I mean, I, I think I live in Death Valley, or I used to at least. Um, but I, I'd say one memorable one that we don't talk about a lot. So before we sold, like not, not that far before we sold, we just had a pinch where we had an investment coming in, didn't work out right at the end, had a little bit of a bump in the road on something. Sales were still good. The company's still going. But like we, we, we almost aced it into the ground. I mean, like legitimately 
the company almost went like, I mean, it, I, technically probably on a financial basis, we were, we were negative tens of millions of dollars um, for a time. And so there was a, a thing I had to go to that if it went the wrong way, I was literally on like the next day going to have to basically fire, you know, 80, 90% of the people and figure out how to, in essence, try to scrap value it for my investors to try to get their money back. And so I had this presentation kind of that I built of like what that would be. And uh, I, I put it because people were in my Dropbox all the time. Like, like I'm kind of a public, like the way I work is kind of public, like, you know, so I let like my team be in stuff. And so I hid it in a folder that was like for my house taxes, uh, you know, just like a random folder in my thing that no one would ever see. And so like uh, two months ago or three months ago, I was in doing something for my accountants. And I'm like, what the heck is this thing? And I opened it up and I was like, oh my God. And so it was like seeing that was just crazy. But but what happened was it ended up working out. As you can see, I didn't need to do that. We ended up like everything went fine. Ended up selling the company like months later to Amazon and keep going. But that was that was definitely one of the lowest. I mean, that was like within, you know, 24 hours of probably like, you know, and that, that and again to bookend that, I mean. You know, you go from, and this is a lot of entrepreneurs have these stories, as you said, um, you can go from that to over a billion dollars within just like, you know, weeks to months. I mean, it's crazy. That's something. So uh, I, I find that there tends to be some kind of core belief out of these Death Valley experiences that becomes a tool in your toolbox that you continue to use. What is it? What was it from that? You know, so I would say like we kept as we were getting into that, it was going in, you know, into the sort of a holiday period. And my thing was all you can focus on is all you can like it's it's um, you, you kind of get very calm and go through the checklist. It's like, what can you still affect? So when when terrible things have happened in the business over time, I've actually gotten much calmer and then just looked at like what levers can I still have effect over? And I'm not going to worry about the things I can't. So and maybe I, maybe you need to clarify yeah, so, so people like, can understand what the yeah, it sounds like, like another inventory issue where maybe there, there was some product glitch and you got like, stuck with like, inventory. Like, you couldn't I couldn't I like you know the investor didn't come in like I can't I can't like it was they're gone like I can't you know beg I, like at some point like I mean you can try but like you, you have to like and you can't just get a new financing in in one day. But what I could affect was the sales. Like I, I could still work hard on making sure we got stocked, making sure we like, so I, I basically put all my focus on like making sure that everything that I had power over, I over indexed on. And so like sales, like I made sure sales went up. Like I did every single thing I could. I mean, literally every single thing I could to focus on that. Even if you looked at it, like being, most people might freak out and be like so worried about what's happening that like they can't. And I just sort of, again, I went into like this like super execution mode of the things that I still had power over. And I kind of didn't worry. I mean, I was upset and stressed, but I didn't like worry about the things I didn't have power over. And that definitely helped us get through it. I mean, that was, you know, that's, so that's what I, and that's what I found in every single one of these things is like when the shit, when the things hit the fan, like you gotta just to me, it's like there are things that you have power over. Focus on those. Don't don't focus on the things that literally you're not going to change, um, because it's just a waste of time. Yeah, that's uh, makes a lot of sense, and it's a it's a feat of focus when you can do it. Um, looking forward to what you're hoping to build and and strategically focus on next. You mentioned community. Um, how much of it is that? Do we need more devices to sort of help uh, neighbors and neighborhoods feel safer and more connected? Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think it's we need. I don't think it's devices like in the if you're just looking at it like like how much you know how many units you have to ship to make neighborhoods safer. I think it's what we need is neighborhoods to continue to have the. Um, I think as our ability to have as a technology company to help supply technologies, again, could be devices, services, things like the neighbors app, uh, APIs that go out to other constituents in the neighborhood, HOAs, police departments, fire departments. 
So I think we need neighborhoods to be able to work together more efficiently using technology to help you know them um, stay safer and also better, I'll say. Because it's not just about like security for us is not just like meaning like literally just like literally crime. It's also lost pets. Um, we're involved in thousands of, uh, you know, and uh, with the neighbors app, you know, uh, pets, you know, finding pets, lost, you know, people, even like, you know, sometimes elderly neighbors will sort of wander off. And, and, and so just having these uh, systems in place so that it's more efficient for neighbors to sort of create a better neighborhood. And to me, what that creates is a better place for kids to grow up in. And if you can change the way that kids grow up and they grow up in a better environment, they you know usually succeed more. So to me, like the long term, like the 50 year effect is make a better neighborhood have, you know, that helps obviously like the, 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 the initial, like the immediate, but it also allows for hopefully the next generations to achieve more because they grew up in a place that was allowed them to sort of spend more time on things that they could be passionate about and learn from. I like the idea that uh, technology can be used also to bolster civil society uh, and safety. We're, we're seeing so many ways that yes, it does that, but then it can also do other things uh, as well. So Jamie, thanks for sharing about Ring, uh, present and past, and about your own story here on Fort Knox. Uh, thank you.